we will be covering one of perhaps the most difficult or probably the most annoying introductory organic chemistry topics, we'll be discussing isomers. Okay? And before we start, we need to define what an isomer is. In fact, you cannot even say what an isomer is because it's always relative. So normally, for you to say that something is an isomer, it should be relative to something else. So I think the proper word to say is that these two are isomers, or maybe, if not, then these two are not isomers, or these three are all isomers. But you cannot say a single thing is an isomer because there's always something you have to compare. Isomers are two or more compounds that are said to have the same molecular formula, yet they have different structures. Okay? So the fact that you're comparing if there is something the same or something different implies that you need to compare at least two different things. Okay? When you say the same molecular formula, it usually means that the carbons, the oxygens, the nitrogens, the hydrogens are the same. If I have one isomer with six carbons, the other isomer has six. It should be exactly the same. But they don't look exactly alike, so they are different in structure. Now, do take note that the moment we say different structure, that's crazy because you might say, what structure? There are a lot of things about structure for organic compounds. And yeah, you're right. That's why we have so many different types of isomers for many different ways of, you know, differentiating structure. And the first thing we need to take on is the word connectivity, which I will go back to later when I'm done with constitutional isomers. But if ever we have different so-called connectivities, Okay, then we can have three possible options. We have skeletal isomers, posi positional, or functional isomers. But if the connectivity is the same, then we have what we call stereoisomers. Okay, and stereoisomers can be further divided by using the question, is it interchangeable? Meaning, by just near rotation or bending or twisting of bonds, can I convert one of my stereoisomers into the other one? If the answer is yes, then we have what we call conformers or conformational isomers. If your answer is no, like no, I cannot just twist or rotate bonds and convert one isomer to another, then we call those as configurational isomers. And if your answer is no, your reason will actually further classify our type of configurational isomerism. If it's due to asymmetry, which we will discuss later what this means, we have an optical isomer in our midst. But if it's a restricted bond, which causes the non-interchangeability, it's geometric. And all of these are technical terms, as expected, because we haven't discussed them yet. But hopefully later, when we, when we cover these one by one, it would make sense. Also, take note that the way that I am particularly uh, classifying configurational isomers may be very different than the one you will find in your handout or in your book. I am aware of that, but I'm going to prefer using this one because it has, uh, for me, made teaching this a little easier than if I use the other one, which uses di diastereomers versus enantiomers. All right, let's get to it. So I did mention that when you have constitutional isomers, they have different connectivity. And by showing you the definition of my three constitutional isomers, I am actually trying to reveal to you what this word, connectivity, even means. So let's start by skelet discussing skeletal isomers. Skeletal isomers are two or three or more compounds that have the same molecular formula, of course. That should be the definition of an isomer. But the difference in their structure is particularly difference in branching. Like, for example, first, observe that all of my carbons... In my three structures here, the carbons are five. The one I just counted was five carbons. This one is one, two, three, four, five. This is also one, two, three, four, five. But this one is linear. It doesn't have a branch. This one has a branch, but only one. But this one has a branch, and well, you can say you have two branches. And the moment that they differ in branching, uh, simply put, it's like, you know, these sticks, you've, you've just disassembled the sticks and then put one of the sticks somewhere else. You call those skeletal isomers. If you're talking about positional isomers, you're talking about different locants. For example, we know that if I have this three carbons, my locant assignment is one, two, three. 
as well as this one, 1, 2, and 3. And the fact that in my two compounds, one bromine, in the, I mean here, my bromine is at 1, and here my bromine is at 2, means that aside from the position of the bromine, nothing changed. So you call these two as positional isomers. Or how about this? Remember our uh, ortho, meta, and para arrangements around benzene? Ortho is like they're directly beside each other, whatever these two are. Meta is there's one carbon distance. Para is opposite of one another. The fact that you're just you know playing around with the positions of these two substituents, positions of these two substituents, they, they are also positional isomers. Okay, and. Uh, the third one is functional. In fact, this is the easiest because it's so it's so well obvious. Like the fact that I have here, let's say OH for alcohols, and here I have an O between two carbons, so that's R O R, so that's a ketone. Like it's 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 a no brainer. Hey, I have different functional groups, so most likely they are functional isomers. So what I'm actually trying to say about connectivity is that connectivity can involve any of the three factors here, branching locant or position of functional groups and the actual functional group if any of those three are different then we have a constitutional isomer but you know what there are some isomers where everything is the same their branchings are the same or some have all of both of them have no branching at all the position of their uh, of their functional groups are the same their functional groups are the same, but then they're not as in exactly the same, and that's weird because if they have the same connectivities, you call them stereo isomers. We have two major types of stereo isomers, the conformational isomers or conformers, as I have written in the outline a while ago, and configurational isomers. Now, um, remember a while ago I used the word interchangeable. Yes for conformer, no for configurational which is brought about, uh, brought about here also by, by this, this part. I, I still repeat what I said. Conformational, interchangeable, config is not interchangeable. Again, when we say interchangeable, it's the capacity for two isomers to become the other one just by mere rotating or twisting of bonds. If you can, you know, just play around with the rotation of your bonds or the, the you bend around the bonds and convert one isomer to another, that's conformational. But for, if for example, for some reason, you're just cannot, you're just incapable of trying to do anything to convert one isomer to another without the need to break a bond, it's configurational. So let me clarify this. That's not inter... Two configurational isomers are not interchangeable, meaning you cannot... Uh, just rotate your bonds and then expect one isomer to become another. But maybe by breaking bonds and then reattaching them, you can actually perform the interchange. But breaking bonds is not an option normally, so we do not use breaking bonds in the terminology interchangeable. It should only be rotating or twisting of bonds. No breaking involved. Okay. It still won't make a lot of sense, so we will really have to go through them one by one later. But the fact that I can interchange one conformer to the other, we can say that they are temporary differences. You can imagine that you are a conformer, and your different conformers are you sitting down, you standing up, you lying down, and probably in other positions. You know, the fact that you can just bend your joints, stand up, you know, and uh, you can go from standing to sitting, sitting to standing by just mere, you know, by bending of your, of your joints. That's interchangeable. So that's what we mean by temporary. But for configurational, like for example, something that is permanent in our body are our two hands. Like, you can never convert your left hand to your right hand or your right hand to your left hand. They're not the same, right? If you like, uh, that's, those are my hands clapping together, both face down. They don't really match. You can try to do it also. Unless you like, you can imagine the morbid idea of like slicing both of your hands and then uh, having them soon, uh, sewn in different arms, which is very uh, horror movie in terms of imagination. But that's, that's the only way that you can make your right hand your left or your left 
you're right. So that's an example of configurational. And why not get straight to it? So let's start with conformational isomers. And I just repeated this word. And again, it's basically the same molecule, just like my analogy with you and your body, standing up, sitting down, lying down. And uh, just like your body, when you compare yourself standing or sitting down or lying down, there are differences in energy in different ways that you, 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 you have your conformation. Okay? Um, let's say sometimes there are conformations that are more stable. There are some conformations that are less stable. And uh, technically speaking, that's the only thing that we care about in conformers, okay? Because a lot of questions here are usually, which is the more stable conformer, and so on and so forth. And that's what we will try to analyze. Do note that in order to understand this completely, you must have an understanding of strains, which I have discussed in the previous uh, lecture. All right, the first type of conformers that we will be encountering are ring conformers and here I take I put the three most common ones the cyclobutane ring cyclopentane ring and the cyclohexane ring so the problem they say with having a square shape for cyclobutane is that um, it's so hard to actually I realize it's so hard to do this without my model we, we have some type, type of toys uh, showing atoms and bonds in the classroom, but I don't have it, of course. It's record. This is a recorded video. But if my ha my two hydrogens are actually drawn, and I look at this in real life, these two hydrogens are actually overlapping. Oh, actually not this, but you can you can see these two. This we can imagine that these two hydrogens are overlapping, or these two hydrogens are overlapping. In short, that's not good because overlapping means there's a strain. So what we can do is you can imagine you're holding this square, uh, like for example, think that you're holding this corner and this corner, and then you kind of twist it so that it becomes something like this in perspective drawing. By doing that, by kind of twisting your, your, your square a little bit, you're trying to separate the bonds that are overlapping, and of course, that will reduce the strain. Or for example, in my cyclopentane, what we can do is maybe what you can uh, imagine here is that this carbon, let's say you, you have your hand, you're holding on that carbon, and then you're flipping it to the center, like so. It's like you're, you're, you're getting this and you're, you're pushing it to the middle. It will look something like this. In fact, it looks more like an envelope shape here. So some, even, some people even call this the envelope configuration of cyclopentane which will kind of reduce the strain. It's extremely difficult to see how it, it reduces the strain in two-dimensional drawing, but uh, long story short, we're actually try, uh, achieving separation of more hydrogens by folding this carbon up. Then the most popular, of course, is for cyclohexane because we can uh, go back to two of the most popular conformers of cyclohexane. This one is called the boat and this is called the chair. If you watched my discussion on structural effects or strains, you would have already seen this one. And for example, I tried to draw all the bonds of the boat in the chair, which is no easy thing to do. For chair, it would be like this. Um, I need to add all of these bonds to carbon. And for boat, it's kind of similar that I'm trying to supply all the missing carbons. Okay, so one thing I would like to highlight is that in the chair, notice that all my bonds here are not, you know, really uh, overlapping on top of one another. They're kind of, how can we call this, well-spaced. And if it's well-spaced, then there's not a lot of strain. But look at this boat. Look at this. What, look at these bonds. What are these two bonds doing? Okay. What are these two bonds doing? They are so close to each other, they literally... You know, if, if it's even possible, they're literally like colliding on each other. And we know that this is called steric effect. Steric effect is a destabilizing force. It's a type of strain, right? So therefore, the boat has something that the chair does not have. Unfortunately, this is not a good thing. So in fact, we can say that the boat is relatively unstable compared to the chair. And the chair, because there's not really any evidence steric effect, this is more stable, at least compared to the boat. And I would like to add something to the discussion. Uh, sadly, we will not anymore like 
uh, perform practice drawings or what we call sometimes ring flippings. Uh, although if you want to have something like that, I could record it separately. Um, if I have uh, my bonds here for my chair conformation, there are some bonds you will notice that are really, really upright or vertical. You call those vertical bonds as the axial bonds. Okay. And uh, the ones that are kind of towards the horizontal axis, kind of towards the x-axis, like this, you call these the equatorial bonds. And you should have six axial and six equatorial bonds for every uh, chair conformation. Also, I may have not said this, but hopefully you do kind of imagine what the wh why the boat is called the boat. Like if I try to draw, let me let me choose a darker color. Like if I try to draw the boat here, it would look like this, right? It would look like a boat. Uh, I think it's nice that I draw it last because otherwise I'd be like covering everything else. For the chair, it they say it looks like a chair. Like um, this one is the part where you put your back on. Then this is where you put your butt on. And then this is like a leg rest. Okay. So... You can think of it like that. So those are conformers for rings. But uh, we have also to deal with something more complicated, which are the rotomers. And they are basically conformers that change to one another, from one to another, by just mere rotation of bonds. And you may be surprised if you watched the previous video about, uh, about our strains. This is something you've already seen. And... Uh, Again, let me repeat that these hydrogens are at the back, and then the hydrogens that are white should be at the front. And it's actually my bad. I should be drawing these bonds all the way to the center. So, yeah, um, let me correct myself in all of the examples here first before we proceed. So all the white ones on front should be you know, drawn all the way to the center. Okay, so the last thing I kind of discussed to you guys here is the fact that this one is called staggered if your h's are far away from each other and if your h's are like overlapping you call this eclipsed and i already mentioned that since in staggered there is lower torsional strain because my hydrogens here are far apart there's not a lot of strain there then this is actually the more stable of the two and then the eclipsed is less stable than the two because the fact that this h and this h kind of overlap that makes it unstable. But what if we can imagine I put one fluorine on the front, which is color white, and one fluorine at the back, which is color yellow. Now, we have to realize this. The moment you try to do something fancy like that, you will now have a situation wherein you have two types of staggered conformations. You have a staggered conformation wherein your two fluorines are exactly on the opposite ends, and then there are some scenarios wherein your two fluorines are kind of closer to one another. We have names for this. The one wherein the two fluorines are so far apart is called the anti-conformation, and the one wherein the fluorines are somehow close to, the, to each other, but still staggered, is gosh. Okay, gosh. Then, notice that these next two are both eclipsed, but it's different. This one is eclipsed wherein my two fluorines are not the ones eclipsing, eclipsing each other, but there is this scenario wherein my two fluorines are really overlapping on top of one another. In this case, we can actually call both as eclipsed, and then we can just give them their synonym, synonyms, but we can call this one at the top as partially eclipsed, and then at the bottom is fully or completely eclipsed. Well, I think that is in the perspective of the fluorine or whatever two things you're comparing. Partial only if my two fluorines are not really perfectly on top of one another, but if they are perfectly on top of one another, you call that fully eclipsed. Do note that they have alternative names. Partial eclipse is sometimes called the anticlinal conformation. And the fully eclipse is sometimes called the sin. Well, because guess what? The two fluorines are on the same plane, exactly. And uh, let's try to evaluate um, which of the following is most stable. First, you have to recognize that anything that's staggered 
any standard because that's a lot of torsional strain that's gone the moment you have a staggered conformation. There's not a lot of torsional strain. It's always going to be more stable than anything that is eclipsed. So meaning, this is definitely going to be a battle between this one and this one for the first place and second place in terms of stability. And for these two eclipses, it's a battle for the third and the last place. So now, let's first go for the battle for first or second. What? I dropped my laptop, sorry. I, I'm going back to this one and then I notice, hey, my fluorines are separated from one another. Here, my fluorines are kind of closer. Isn't being too close to one another bad? Right? So actually, the fact that my two fluorines here are kind of closer to each other, we have relatively higher steric effect between the two. This one, I mean, man, the fluorines are so far from one another. There is definitely little steric effect there. We know that steric effect is a strain, so it lessens the stability. So this is less stable. This is more stable. So therefore, this is the most stable. This is rank 1, and as I mentioned, the loser here is rank 2. So the anti configuration is the most stable, which makes sense because you want your two fluorines to be farthest from each other. I mean, hello, they hate each other. Electronegative atoms hate each other, so it's best to keep them separate. Then, now, it's a battle for third and fourth, and we're going to apply the same principle here. Although both are eclipsed and both are unstable already, which is more stable and which is less. Well, here, my two fluorines are not exactly on top of one another, so you can kind of forgive it for that case, like, okay, it's not the worst case scenario. So there is little steric effect in terms of the fluorine. But my god, once you see these two fluorines, like, heading on, like, really overlapping one another, not only do you have extreme torsional strain because they overlap, they also have extreme steric strain because, like, that's the worst thing you can do. These two fluorines hate each other, and then you're placing them on top of one another. That makes it very, 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 very unstable. So this is the least stable. This is before the least stable. So the order is like this. In terms of the stability from highest to lowest, it would be anti, gauche, partial eclipsed, and full eclipsed. And uh, in fact, in some textbooks, they even go as far as showing you energy diagrams, comparing the energies of these four. I'm not going to do that here, but in case someone needs help there, I think I can help out. Okay, so for now, we're done with all of these constitutional isomers. We're also done with conformers. And now, I'm going to cut this, and my part two would be all about configurational isomers. There's a lot to consider in terms of naming them, so stay tuned for, for that. Wait for it. Uh, most likely, you will see it immediately after this part one of isomers.